How you doing, fellas? Good. Cool. Nice Welcome, guys. Hey, how are you, mate? Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you again. Again, I know. Hey, man. We always see you around food. I know. <laughs> Jesus, thank you for today that we can be here. Um, Holy Spirit, we pray you just be with our hearts tonight. Encourage us. Give us the words to say as we talk about loving one another tonight. We thank you for everyone here that you've brought us together, um, especially for all the many things you've blessed us with. We praise you, Lord, and look forward to this evening for your glory. In your name, amen. amen. For me, like what really motivates me the most about community groups and what excites me the most is seeing people really grow in their walk with the Lord. And whether that's becoming a new Christian, which we've seen, um, we were going through the Real Marriage series and the men and women had split up because it was the night talking about sexual sin. We're going around the circle. We get to this one guy who's like 16 and he had, um, he'd been there for coming for a little while and we just got there and, and one of the guys leading discussion, he's like, just talked for a little while and then he's like, do you wanna accept Jesus? And he's like, I do. And he accepted Jesus right there. Okay. And uh, then he talked about his sexual sin and then we went to the next guy and talked about their sexual sin. And that whole night was just like really powerful. So those times where you really get to see the Holy Spirit work in people, uh, me, uh, myself as a community group leader, getting to experience that's amazing. We've seen people baptized, people get saved. I had gone through a previous medical issue and um, I had just, I was experiencing some problems that could be that that problem came back. And I just remember um, when we separated going in with the, with the gals, just how they prayed over me. I'd never been prayed over like that and um, it just really touched me. Hey Brock, come on in. It's a weird little dude. <laughs> no. I mean, community group, you get one-on-one -on -one time talking with people, hearing about their daily lives, hearing about what they went through uh, this week, and, um, and you really, uh, you get to do life together, and you get to share experiences, and you really get involved in each other's life, and, uh, and you can hear awesome stories about what the work that God's doing in their life, and just how uh, He's growing and teaching them and how the sermon has applied to them, how they've learned something new from the Bible. It's just, it's awesome to see Jesus at work in people's life in the community groups, and that's what it's all about. What if we all had exactly one hour until Jesus returned? How would we live? How would we even recognize that his return is close? Those are exactly the questions that we're going to answer today as we continue our study in 1 John 2. So if you brought a Bible, let me encourage you to turn to 1 John 2. We have a lot of text to cover. It's going to be a little bit technical today. 1 John is at the very back of your Bible, so let me encourage you to go there. As you're turning there, let me pray. Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you want us to know the things that you want us to know, and that you're a God who reveals himself. Thank you that you've ultimately made yourself known through your son, Jesus. Jesus, thank you that you promised to return, and we can count on your words. You, you are a trustworthy God. Jesus, you lived the only perfect life that's ever been lived. You went to the cross, and there you paid the penalty for our sins, for those of us who trust in you. You've risen from the grave. You're at the right hand of the Father. And today, as we look at the Bible, we want to worship you. Father and Son, thank you for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would, you would help us to see today what it means to live a life in relationship with Jesus. I pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts to see more clearly how much Jesus wants relationship with us. And Holy Spirit, I pray for those who don't know Jesus, that they would meet him right here today and their lives would forever be changed. In his good name we pray, amen. 1 John 2, we're gonna pick up in verse 18, right where we left off last week. And uh, we've got some really technical things to cover today. So there's gonna be a lot of explanation uh, and then we're gonna apply what we've learned together as we get towards the end of this time together. Uh, John 
is very Hebrew in his thinking. And inspired by the Holy Spirit, he tends to think in, in nonlinear terms. So as he writes what he writes, uh, there's some ideas that are presented, then taken away, then brought back. And it's kind of hard to just walk through verse by verse uh, train of thought sometimes. So here's what I want to do. I want to read this text in its entirety then we're going to break it down in a way that I think it'll stick with us a little bit better. So 1 John 2, let me read through it, then we'll break it down and unpack it. 1 John 2, beginning in verse 18. Children, it is the last hour. And as if you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies Jesus is the Christ. That is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and Son. No one, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you have received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him." A lot to unpack here, so let's take this text in its entirety and package it a little bit differently so that we can understand the big point that John wants to make to us. As he begins this text today, he reminds his first listeners and first readers that he sees them as children. And that's a comforting thing, that John is their spiritual father. It's also comforting to know that God relates to us as a father does his children, because what follows is very difficult. The first thing that John wants us to know is that we are living in the last hour. That may be reason for alarm, but we are living in the last hour. Look at this text again. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Does John have your attention this morning? We're living in the last hour. Now, here's what you need to know. When the Bible speaks of the last hour, the Bible doesn't speak of that hour being figuratively 60 minutes. Here's the way the Bible looks at the finality, the consummation of history. The last hour began as Jesus came to this earth, the eternal son of God took on human form. He came and he lived on this earth. He lived the only perfect life that's ever been lived. He went to the cross and there he died for our sin in our place. He rose from the grave and as he ascended into heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit. And that began the last hour according to the Bible. We are living in the last days. We are living in the last hour. And all that's left is for Jesus to return to the earth physically, visibly, and establish his kingdom permanently. And the evidence that we're living in the last hour has to do with the concept of antichrist and antichrist. So let me show you some other texts that will prove this point. This is what Jesus had to say about what was going to happen from Matthew 24. For false Christs... And false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. The word antichrist means in place of or in opposition to Christ. So Jesus himself, omniscient Jesus, who sees the future, makes it very clear for those who will follow him, there will be those who rise up in his name, that they will be a counterfeit to what he is and who he is, and their attempt will be to lead others astray. 
as the New Testament unfolds, as Revelation progresses, we see more definition of this one person who one day will be known as the Antichrist. This is from Paul's writings to the Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians, if we could go there, verses 1 through 4. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, in other words, Jesus is going to fulfill all of history. He's going to come. He's going to draw his people together. We will be with him forever in his kingdom. We ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed. That's important. We're living in the last hour, but we want to stay calm. All right, and carry on. Shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. As we look at the scripture unfold, there is a prophecy that there will be one who opposes Jesus, who offers another form of Jesus that's greater than all others. And we refer to him as Antichrist. And when he comes, he will want the world to worship him. There's been much speculation over history who this person is. Some people may believe that he's already come. Some people looked at, at Adolf Hitler and said, there's the Antichrist. I remember when I first became a Christian that there were those, and probably some of you may still believe this, that Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist. Remember this argument that Ronald Wilson Reagan, three names, six letters, 666, there you have it. Reagan is the Antichrist. Do you remember that? Taken out of prophecy, out of context. But there will come a day when the Antichrist comes who will establish himself as the one to be worshipped above all others, and he is another form of or in opposition to Jesus. And what John is saying here is history is unfolding just as Jesus said it would. That we indeed are in the last hour. What we await is Jesus' second coming to consummate and fulfill all of history. And the proof that we're in this last hour is already there have been precursors to the Antichrist. Those who are Antichrist offering up, if you will, another form of Jesus or an opposition to Jesus who started in the church and left the church. Marcel Church, we're living in the last hour. We're living in the last hour. It's not a literal last hour because this text was written 2,000 years ago, but you and I should live with a sense of finality. We should live with a sense of purposeness, purposefulness as we're in this last hour. How should we live? What should we expect? What should we look for? According to this text, two things are going on. The first thing that's happening in the last hour that we need to be mindful of that we need to be aware of is that false teachers deceive. Look at the next text. Back to 1 John. These are the antichrists who've already come. Oftentimes when scripture portrays something large happening, a a, a significant figure coming, there's foreshadowing to that figure coming in lesser characters. And this is what we see going on here. 1 John 2.19. They, these antichrists, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would not have continued with us. Is that a tongue twister of a verse or not? But they went out that that it might become plain that they all are not of us. Now, when John is using the term us, I don't think he's referring to the Christians he's writing to. I think he has a more specific group in mind. I believe he's referring to the apostolic community. The Bible makes it very clear that Jesus designated apostles. And when we look at the New Testament unfolding, our New Testament, the Bible that we have that explains who Jesus is, explains what the church is about, explains all that's going to happen, is written by the apostles and New Testament prophets. So I believe what John is saying here is there are members of the apostolic community broadly that at one point in time looked like they were apostles, but they actually left that community. They departed from the church. First thing you need to know about false teachers is they leave the church. 
Now, I don't mean they leave one local church for another. I'm not talking about that. People move from local churches to local churches. Even teachers will move from local churches to local churches. Moving from one local church to another local church does not make you an antichrist. So please don't call anyone who leaves our church to go to another church the antichrist. That's not what this text means. What it means is there are those who once seem to give credence seem to give lip service to that which the apostles were teaching, namely and mostly the person and work of Jesus who didn't really believe in Jesus and they left that community because they didn't belong to it. And we're to identify false teachers in in as much as they no longer adhere to apostolic teaching. They no longer adhere to biblical teaching and they don't belong to the church. They have left, they leave the church. Growing up, I uh, met Jesus when I was a youth, when I was in middle school. And one of, the most, one of the most important figures in my life was a youth leader who was a dynamic Bible teacher. And I remember loving to hear this man teach and preach. And every time he did, my, my life seemed to be transformed. And I knew him personally, spent time with him personally. Every time we'd get together, he'd open the Bible up and say, Dave, here's something you need to know. And it was, it was life-changing. This man left and went to another church, and in time, some of us that were in his youth group as we became young adults realized he left his family, left his wife and his children, abandoned them, and began to pursue a life apart from them. And so uh, one of the members of the the former youth group wrote him a letter saying, what gives? How is it right that you as a Christian would would leave your family? You've, You've influenced so many of us. We want you to walk with Jesus, and you need to come back home to your family. And he responded to this letter, and his message was very simple. Thank you for your concern. I just want you to know that I don't really believe anymore what you think I used to believe. He left the church. He left the church doctrinally in that he no longer believed the foundation of the church, which is the Bible. He no longer believed in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ as he proclaimed he used to, and relationally he left the church. That's who these false teachers are. They didn't have a relationship with Jesus that they've lost. They deceived themselves in the beginning of thinking they ever had a relationship with Jesus. They don't belong to Jesus. They don't belong to the Christian community, but they are outside of the community trying to affect the community to follow them. First thing you need to know about false teachers is they deceive, and they deceive by leaving the church. The second thing they do is they deceive by lying about Jesus. Look at our next text. Strong words, right? Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Father has the Father. On the flip side, whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. This is a point John is going to make over and over and over again in the letter. We believe in a triune God. The Bible holds forth a God who is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And John is very clear that if you deny Jesus, if you deny God the Son and all his claims to be who he is, if you deny him, then you also deny the Father. In essence, they're inseparable. You can't divorce them. You can't can't divide them. So to deny Jesus is to deny the Father. But the good news is if you confess Jesus and you believe in all that Jesus says he is, not only do you receive Jesus, you receive God the Father and God the Spirit as well. And one of the great points of controversy in the early church had to do with the central feature of Christianity, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what the Bible says holds forth about Jesus. Jesus himself says as much. The Bible says two things about Jesus, that Jesus in one person, the person of Jesus, is both simultaneously, he's fully God, he's divine, and he's fully human. Theologians will call this concept the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union means that in one person, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, there are two natures, that Jesus is simultaneously, perfectly, fully God, and he's fully man. And false teachers lie or distort about the reality of the person of Jesus. 
And most false teaching will fall into one of those two categories, meaning they either deny the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, or they deny the humanity of Jesus. In the early church, there was a group that denied that Jesus was really God. And maybe this is our common cultural perspective of Jesus, right? He's a good teacher. He's a good example. We should follow him as a leader of a cause, like we follow Gandhi or other leaders in the world. He's a great martyr. He's a great prophet. But we deny his divinity. He's a great man, but he's not God. In the early church, this distortion, this heresy was called Arianism. The idea that Jesus was fully man, but he wasn't fully God. Then you had a different group, a separate category, that saw the divinity of Jesus, but they denied his humanity. Well, he appeared to be human, but he was some type of apparition because material things are corrupt. Therefore, we believe Jesus is God. We deny that he's human. And what John is warning us here, if you miss, if you take a swing and you miss at the person of Jesus, you not only miss out on Jesus, you miss out on Christianity, and you miss out on any hope of a relationship with God. Because Jesus being fully human and Jesus being fully God are inseparable, and they have to come together in the person of Jesus for Jesus to be who he said he is. And faith is basically believing, Jesus, you are who you say you are. I want to turn from my false idolatry of creating you in a different category, and I want to accept you as you say you are. That's what Christianity is all about. I, I have experienced this to a much lesser degree, and I want, to hear, I want you to hear me very clearly. I am not saying in any way I'm Jesus, okay? Let's make that point. Not that you needed to be convinced of that. I'm not Jesus. But what I learned in ministry is I simultaneously, in the body, in the church, have two roles that play themselves out continuously. I'm a pastor, which means I have biblical authority to love and serve and care for you, but I'm also a member of the family, too. I'm, I'm a brother, And I remember these conversations playing out when I first got into ministry, especially among peers that I loved. And and, and, and in their language, I had to put on my pastor hat. In other words, there was sin in their lives, there was foolishness in their lives, and it came to that point in time where I had to open up the Bible and say, hey, you know what? I love you. I care for you. I need to confront you because if you don't change, you're uh, you're headed for disaster. And oftentimes in those conversations, what the guys would say to me is, you know, I appreciate that, but I want you to be my brother, not my pastor. Notice, I don't really want to be confronted right now. I I need to have sympathy. I need to have compassion. I need to have empathy. So would you take off your pastor hat, put on your brother hat, and would you be to me more of a brother than you're being a pastor right now? Now, here's what I learned. I, I I can't do that. I simultaneously have two roles. I am a brother. And I am a pastor, so I'd have to explain to them, I, there's not a point I'd go home at, at, at night and, and take off who I am as a pastor, leave it at the door, go into my house, then come out the next day like, like Clark Kent or Superman and put on something. That's not who I am. I'm always a pastor as long as I'm recognized as a pastor in the church. There's not a minute that I'm not a pastor, and I'm always a brother with you for all eternity. So you can't divide my natures in that sense. Now, here's where it all came together in a good way. I, uh, and maybe some of you had this church experience. I, uh, I was doing a men's retreat in a, in, a, in a southern context. I won't tell you what state, but I was doing uh, a men's retreat, and I showed up there, and there was, a, there was just a kindly, dignified old gentleman who was setting things up, and he somehow either recognized my face or recognized I didn't know where I was, and so he knew that I was the speaker for that week, and he looked at me and he said, so nice to have you here brother, pastor. And I thought, boom, that's it. That's exactly who I am. I'm both and. Why don't you call me brother, pastor from now on? It breaks down at some point where they call the worship leader brother, singer, and everybody's brother, sister, something. But he got it. False teachers trip over the person of Jesus. They either see him as human and not divine, or they see him as divine and not human. And what John is saying is Jesus is the Christ. He is who he says he is. He's the one anointed by God. He is fully God and he's fully human. And if you try to subdivide him or you try to misrepresent him, you lose with Jesus all of Christianity. You have no relationship with God the Father because you can't deny the Son and have a relationship with the Father. But 
The good news is if you believe in the Son, then you also have a relationship with God the Father. Big picture. Don't want you to get lost in the weeds here. Here's what John is saying. Hey, children, people who belong to Jesus, we're living in the last hour. Time is drawing to a close. Jesus is going to be returning. Pay attention. Be alert. Understand the times in which you live. How do we recognize these times? We recognize these times by false teachers deceiving. What do false teachers do? They do at least two things. They leave the church doctrinally and relationally, relationally, and they lie about Jesus. So what can we do? What does it look like for you and I as followers of Jesus to live in the last hour? Here's what we can do. True Christians believe. Some great promises here, ready? But you, okay, we're moving away from talking about antichrists and false teachers. Now we're talking about those of us who belong to Jesus. But you have been anointed. It's a beautiful concept out of the Old Testament. You've been anointed by the Holy One. When John speaks of the Holy One, he speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you all have knowledge. I write to you, this is important to know, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Don't you love how John is always reassuring? Don't you love what he's saying here? Dear children, I'm writing, to, I'm writing this to you not because you don't know Jesus, not because you don't know what's true. I'm writing to reassure you that you are legit, that you exactly know who Jesus is and you belong to him. You've been anointed. It's a powerful concept. Here's what the Bible teaches us about Jesus. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Jesus did ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus to his followers, you and me, has anointed us with the Holy Spirit. We have received the Holy Spirit. And the the reason we know we've received the Holy Spirit is that we believe that which is true. Let me show you this in Jesus' words. John 16, 13. This is Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit who is to come on his followers. When the Holy Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Wouldn't this be reassuring as a disciple of Jesus? I don't know about you, but I'm the worst note taker in the world. And if you're a disciple of Jesus, wouldn't you be thinking, oh, you said so many things. What, what? I'm going to forget something. And Jesus reassures reassures his guys by saying, "Don't, don't worry. The Holy Spirit, whom I will give you, he will will not only illuminate the truth for you, he will will guarantee the truth in you. That's what it means to be anointed. If you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, according to the Bible, then that's clear evidence that you've been anointed by the Holy Spirit because you can't believe the Bible without the working of the Holy Spirit. Make sense? This is what the Bible teaches about having a saving relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You and I can't believe. It's impossible for us to believe until the Holy Spirit goes to work in our hearts. When the Holy Spirit regenerates us and he takes our dead hearts, our cold hearts, our rebellious hearts, and he softens them by giving us a new heart, we believe in Jesus. As we believe in Jesus, we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we're anointed by the Holy Spirit, and this deposit of truth that we have, believing in who Jesus is, is guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. If your profession today is that Jesus is the Christ, He's the only way that I can have the forgiveness of sin. He's the only way that I can be free to live a life of worship as God created me to live. He indeed is the one only who is fully God and fully man. If that's your profession today, take heart because it means that you've been anointed by the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit has anointed you, he is going to guard permanently that deposit of your belief and he's going to see you through. And John is saying, I write to you not because you don't believe, but because you do. I'm not condemning you. I'm reassuring you. I'm confirming that that which you believe is true. Christian, hear me out. 
If indeed the only reason that you believe and I believe in Jesus is because the Holy Spirit has in his own grace and mercy gifted us belief, he's regenerated us and he's anointed us, then we should hold our faith in great humility when it comes to interacting with those who don't believe, right? Think of it this way. When my kids were little, all four girls, we took a family trip to, uh, to Disney World. And uh, I'd been on so many spinning rides and looked at so many uh, princess displays. They had the autograph books. It was a weird thing to see my little girls in line to get autographs and then a bunch of middle-aged men who wanted to get autographs from princesses. It was disturbing. Something was wrong with that. So I let them go alone, and I didn't want the princess autographs. But we'd seen so many princesses, uh, been on so many rides. We came to this 3D spectacular. I'm not sure but I think it had something to do with a bug's life. And so we went into this room, and as you went into this room, it was, it was a theater, and there were all kinds of special effects, but the, the feature of it was a 3D film. And I was handed a pair of 3D glasses, and uh, this is gonna say a lot about my own uh, issues, but I looked at it, I thought, you know, I don't think I'm gonna put these on. This is gonna be the one pair that the Disney worker didn't sanitize well, and I know the guy who wore them previously, had scabies, um, <laughs> head lice for sure, and probably some kind of fungus behind his ear. So I refuse to wear these glasses. As I told you, I have issues. I am working on them. We sit down in the theater. I'm just watching the faces of my wife and kids, and they're just going crazy. They're jumping. They're screaming. They're looking at the screen. There's, there's air blowing in our faces. There's things in our seats, like jabbing us. It's Rather uncomfortable, really. But I'm just detached from this experience because I can't see what they see. All I see on the screen are blurry images, but they're jumping back and they're diving in. And I realize I don't see things the way they see them because I don't have the glasses. What John is saying is the only way you and I will ever clearly see Jesus as he is, according to his word, is through the lens of the Holy Spirit. We have an anointing. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit allows us to see from the pages of Scripture the real Jesus emerge. You remember reading the Bible before you were a Christian? Like, I can't make sense of this. This is about a thousand different things, and this is bizarre, and this is weird. And then all of a sudden, you profess faith in Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit, and the Bible begins to make sense. And Jesus becomes clear. Christian, hear me out. As we live in a culture that's growingly hostile to Christians, I want you to be humble. I don't want you to look at people who don't know Jesus and think of yourself as smarter than them because you're not. I don't want you to look at people who don't know Jesus and think you're better than them because you're not. The only difference between those of us who believe and those who don't believe is those of us who believe have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has regenerated us and we see Jesus through the lens of the Holy Spirit and there are those in our culture who don't have them. We should love them. We should not be haughty towards them. We should humbly pray that they too would receive the Holy Spirit so that they might see Jesus as we do. Amen? Big idea. Big idea. We're living in the last hour. How do we know we're living in the last hour? Because false teachers deceive. What does that look like? They, they leave the doctrine of the church. They leave the church relationally. They lie about Jesus. What should we do? True Christians believe we're an anointed people. Not only are we anointed people, we're an abiding people. Look at this. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise he made to us, eternal life. Now, now circle that phrase. We're going to come back to it. We're going to circle back around. Super important. Don't think I've forgotten it just because I move on. I promise to come back to it. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing of the Holy Spirit that you have received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in 
him. We're living in the last hour. What should we do? True Christians believe. What does that mean? It means we're an anointed people. The Holy Spirit has anointed us so that the message that we believed in is confirmed over and over and over again. What else does it mean? It means we're an abiding people. I want you to understand what this word abiding means. It means you build your house permanently and you live there. Doesn't look like the tent that you put out in the woods. It doesn't look like a hotel or an apartment or a transitionary place you're gonna live for a season. It means build your house here and live permanently. You and I as Christians, we live in the message that we heard at the beginning, the message that's confirmed and taught to us over and over again by the one in whom we're anointed, the Holy Spirit. I want you to understand what it means to be a Christian. Very basic, but so important. It means we're people of the word. The word of God is active and living and dynamic and we live in the word of God and the word of God lives in us. It means we're people of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit illuminates the Word of God. The Holy Spirit guarantees the Word of God. The Holy Spirit activates the Word of God so it has tremendous impact. And you and I, we live permanently. We build our house on the gospel, on the truth of the Word of God. People trip up over this text and say, Pastor Dave, what does this mean? Are we saying that uh, the Holy Spirit is the subject here? Are we saying the Word of God is it? What what is it? How, How do we change? Is it through the indwelling Word of God, or is it through the Holy Spirit? The answer to that is what? Yes. Yes. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God, the Holy Spirit works hand in glove with the Word of God, right? We're not saying they're the same thing. One is God, the Holy Spirit. He's God. He's a personal God. The Word, the word of God is his communication to us. But the Holy Spirit works hand in glove with the Word of God. So when you and I talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit works in sync with the gospel, the truth of the Bible about Jesus. The more we believe, the more we're filled. The more we're filled, the more we believe. Do you see what's going on here? Let me show you some proof text that I think will demonstrate this. Um, Look at these passages, and I want you to compare. These aren't contrasting passages. These are comparative passages. They're almost parallel passages. Ready? From uh, the letter to the Ephesians. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Look at Colossians 3. Very similar outcomes. Different subjects, similar outcomes. Ready? Let the word of Christ, that's the word about Jesus, we would call that the gospel. The Bible's about the person and work of Jesus. The Bible isn't about a thousand different principles. The Bible's about one person. His name is Jesus. Let the word of Christ dwell in you, Richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound like what we just read in Ephesians chapter 5? With thankfulness in your hearts to God. Next text. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Same outcome. What brings about this outcome? Is it the word of Christ dwelling in us richly or is it us being filled with the Holy Spirit? Which is it? Both, right? The Holy Spirit and the word of God, they're not not the same thing, okay? They're not synonyms, but in essence, they work in sync together. That what John is telling us is, hey, that which you believed in the beginning about Jesus that was given to you by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will guarantee it. Live in those words. Let those words live in you. And the Holy Spirit, he's the power source that will allow you to live in these words. And you don't have anybody outside the body. You don't have a need for anybody outside the church to teach you about Jesus because what you've already believed is true. And the Holy Spirit will reaffirm what you believe over and over and over again. Do we believe this is true? I don't mean intellectually. Do we practically believe that the Holy Spirit 
He works hand in glove with the gospel of Jesus to make us into a people who think, feel, act, and speak like Jesus, that together they're a powerful epoxy. Do we believe that? A few years ago, I, a uh, decade ago, let's be honest, a long time ago, I, uh, I, I was racing bikes for a little while, not motorcycles, I'm not that cool, uh, road bikes. And I will confess, for a time in my life, and I've since repented, I wore spandex. But anyway, different story, <laughs> different time. I hate that I just gave you that mental image, forgive me. <laughs> and I, I had an old school road bike, and those of you who ride bikes will know how old this bike was, where the, the shifters were actually on the down tube, before everything was on the, the handlebars. And I was riding one day, and all of a sudden, one of my shifters fell off the down tube. And so I tried to keep it out of my chain. I got out of, the, got out of that without being hurt, took it to the bike store. I don't know anything about anything mechanically, particularly bikes. And so I had a guy at the bike store named Bob. Bob was my go-to guy who told me how to fix things myself. I said, Bob, my downshifter came off. It's detached. I need to put it back on the down tube. What should I do? And he said, oh, he said, I got the perfect product. Went in the back of the store brought out this product. He said, here's an epoxy. Um, what you'll need to do is you need to clean off the down tube, and if you'll apply this epoxy to the bike and then put the shifter back on, it will never fall off. He's like, this is the nuclear best. Take it home, enjoy it. You're welcome. So I took it home. Typical me, didn't read any instructions. I just went on what Bob told me, went to the down tube, cleaned off the down tube, got the shifter, took one of the tubes of epoxy, poured it on, stuck it. It fell off. Well, that's weird. Maybe it needs more. So I emptied out the whole tube, stuck it, and at least for a little while, because the shifter was now e emerged in goo on the, on the down tube there, I, I couldn't even reach it to shift it, and then it fell off again. And I thought, well, this is ridiculous. So I went back, once again, cleaned off the down tube on the bike, got the second tube of epoxy, applied it, stuck it, fell off again, emptied out the second tube entirely, filled it, stuck it, fell off again. So I went back to Bob and I was hot. Like, man, you ripped me off. You had me. You gave me these two tubes of epoxy. You said it would make, you would make the downshifter be a fix forever. I put it on there. It didn't work. I'm disappointed. I want my money back. I said, I went through both tubes. He said, you went through both tubes? He said, you shouldn't have needed that much. I said, I went through both tubes. He said, no, Dave, it's an epoxy, which means the way that it's constructed chemically, when you put these two ingredients, you take a little bit of this tube and a little bit of that tube, you mix them together, there's a bonding that happens in the elements and the chemicals, and that's what causes the thing to affix to your bike. You did it all wrong. The two don't do anything apart from each other, but you put the two together, and they're powerful. Oh, thanks, Bob. Let me have another one of those products. I'll try it again. Better yet, why don't you do it, Bob, and I'll pay you. Isn't that the way the Holy Spirit works with the Bible? When you and I live a life in which the Word of God abides in us, we've internalized the Word of God through the assistance and empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and we begin to see Jesus as he is, and our lives in the power of the Holy Spirit begin aligned, become aligned with who Jesus is, and guess what? The Holy Spirit and the Bible, they work powerfully in our lives that we can be sure we believe because we're being transformed. That's all that John is saying here. Big picture, ready? Let's put this all together, and I wanna draw out three applications, and then we're done. Big picture is this. We're living in the last hour. This is it. Time is drawing to an end. How do we know that? Because false teachers are deceiving. They're, they're leaving the church doctrinally and relationally, and they're lying about Jesus. Oh, no, what should we do? We should stay calm and believe. That's what we should do. We should believe that we are an anointed people, and the Holy Spirit is going to see us through. We should be an abiding people. We should build our house on the word of God. Three questions for you, and we'll finish this morning. Number one, are you living in the Word? Are you living in the Word of God? What's your plan? Are you constantly intaking God's Word? Let me give you a suggestion. Go wide and go deep. Read the Bible broadly, something I began doing 15 years ago. I'm not a great reader. I'm not a fast reader. 
I don't have great retention, began to read through the Bible every year. And it's amazing when you read through broad swaths of the Bible, you see how integrated the parts are. That the Bible isn't about a thousand principles to live by, it's one person, Jesus, to live for. And as you and I, we survey the Bible, we see Jesus portrayed on every page and every word, and we fall more in love with him as the Holy Spirit illuminates the truth of the Bible. And go deep. As you read through the Bible broadly, find those passages that just capture your heart. Memorize them. Meditate on them. Study them. Open up a concordance. Get a commentary. Go deep into the Bible. Expose yourself to preaching. Hear the Bible. Study the Bible. Read the Bible. Live in the Bible. Here's what I'm doing right now. And we'll put something out for you that will help you if you'd like to do the same. I've got a Bible reading plan. I've used it for quite a few years now that I, I, I read chapters in the Bible a day so I can get a broad sense of what's going on in the Bible, and then I go deep in one passage. Here's where I'm at personally. This last year has been really hard. It's been difficult. It's been difficult for me personally. It's been difficult for us together as a church. Very difficult season. My propensity when things get tough is to lean into solutions, right? I'm going to lean into some ideas, and here's what we can do to fix this and correct this. When I looked at the Bible, particularly was reading through the Psalms, I saw when those who wrote the Psalms had difficult times, they didn't lean into solutions. They leaned into the Savior, right? They, from the heart level, particularly David, he leaned into God as his Savior. I thought, that's what I want to be. So what I've been doing is I've been reading through the Bible broadly and in a year, but I've been going deep in the Psalms, particularly Psalm 16 memorizing that psalm, thinking about it every day, I encourage you to do the same. Are you living in the word? Second question I have for you is this. Is the word living in you? That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. A follower of Jesus lives in the word and lives out the word. The Bible is dynamic. The Bible isn't like any other book. The truths of the Bible are living and active, and they begin to form our affections. They shape our attitudes. They determine our actions. It's a living, breathing word empowered by the Holy Spirit. Are you living out the word as you're forming your feelings, as you're dialing in your perspective of what's going on, as you're acting out? Is it the Bible that's acting in you and through you through the power of the Holy Spirit? Or are you just leaning on your own understanding, your own wisdom, your own experience? Dinner the other night. Family was entirely gathered around. And uh, one of my daughters, all my daughters are, are, are uh, growing into young women, godly young women. I'm very thankful for that. One of my daughters asked if she could uh, have a second ch chance at an area of freedom that we had allowed her earlier and that didn't go as well as we had hoped it went. So she said, hey, Dad, can I? And she asked the question. And I looked at her and I said, well, you know what? That didn't go so well the last time. Tears cascaded down her face. She was heartbroken at my words. She pushed her chair away from the table. She left the table and made her way to her room. And all the other eyes were on me like, you're such a jerk. You know what? What? And I thought, you know, I know I've done something wrong. I said, excuse me, family, I need to go for a walk. Because I wanted to, I know I'd done something wrong. I know I had done something hurtful. I just wanted to understand what I had done from a biblical perspective so that I could come back to my daughter and I could apologize and I could own what I had done. So I, I began to take a walk around the block and I didn't even make it halfway around when I realized this is what I've done. I've been a historian. I've been an accountant. I condemned my daughter again over something that Jesus had already forgiven and freed her from. And specifically, this verse came to mind from 1 Corinthians 13, 5, the famous love chapter. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. And what I had done when my daughter asked for a second chance in this area is I took her back to, here's the wrong you did last time. Let me pull up your record and assess. No, nope, you can't do that again because you blew it last time. The word of God lived in me. It showed me exactly with a verse what I had done wrong and, and the error of my heart and how I was acting incompatible and inconsistently with the love that God had for my daughter. And I went into a room and I apologized through tears and she forgave me. And I realized the word of God is living in me. I'm living in the word of God and the word of God is living in me. 
Is the word of God living in you today? Are the affections of your heart stirred by the word of God? Are the attitudes of your mind, are they formed by the word of God? Are the actions of your hands, are they, are they, are they determined by the word of God? Last question, and we'll get back to this point that I skipped over earlier. Are you living the eternal life today? Eternal life, according to the Bible, isn't something that's out there. It's right here, right now, for those of us who are Christians, right? When you receive the gift of salvation, the gift of forgiveness of sin that God gives us in Jesus, you immediately enter into eternal life. And the beauty of that eternal life is it's unending. Even in death, even if you were to die in this moment, your spirit immediately goes to Jesus and you have uninterrupted eternal life. And Jesus will ultimately bring eternal life to its fruition when he returns and you receive your resurrected body to live with him without sin, without death, without fear, without crying, without anything that that weighs us down now for all eternity. But eternal life begins right here and now. Are you living out eternal life? Now, Now here's my question to you today. You and I tend to think of eternal life in terms of quantity, right? And that's true. When we meet Jesus, it's forever, uninterrupted, You can't attach years to it. It goes on indefinitely, forever, into the future, infinity and beyond. But Jesus emphasized not just the quantity of eternal life. He gave eternal life equality. Look at this from John 17, 3. This is Jesus praying for his disciples. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is perpetually living in a dynamic relationship with God the Father and God the Son, empowered by the Holy Spirit, in which we progressively know more and more about God, and we know him better, and he knows us fully. And it's like any other personal relationship. With time, it gets deeper, it gets sweeter, it gets better. Do do you know God in that way today? I believe this is what John is saying. Hey, the end is near. We're living in the last hours. There are going to be those who want to deceive you, but I want you, to, I want you to stay and I want you to live in. I want you to abide in the eternal life that's yours today. Know God and know Jesus through the Bible. That's what I want for you. Do you know God better today than you did yesterday and the day before? Isn't the amazing thing about God is when do you ever get to the depth of God? When can you ever say, I've got him figured out. Check that off my bucket list. Now I'm going to go skydiving. Now, when do you do that? There's no end to the depth of God. We will spend all of eternity knowing God, and we will never get bored. We will never get discouraged. We will never be dissatisfied. We will know God deeper and deeper and more closely each and every aspect. However time is marked out in eternity, we will have an ongoing, deeper understanding of the fullness of God and we'll never be tired, we'll never be bored, we'll never be dissatisfied. Why not start today? My father-in-law lost his second kidney about a year ago. Second bout of renal cancer, they had to take his second kidney and and, and radically changed his quality of life. Has to do dialysis for four to five hours, three days a week. Can never go too far without it. And so many people would look on and say, well, this present life has lost a lot of quality, but someday you'll be made whole in the kingdom of God. So it finished well, and then someday you'll experience healing. Don't feel sorry for my father-in-law. I got to spend time with him this summer. And I was amazed at how he was living out eternal life right here and right now. Without any kidneys, constantly connected to dialysis, he is pouring his life into the word of God. The word of God is pouring into him and he knows Jesus better than any other time of his life. And in the midst of a life that seems to be shrinking, he can't go places, he can't do the things he used to do. He is happier and more satisfied than he's ever been because he knows Jesus more fully than he ever has. It's the last hour. Why not enjoy eternal life today? 
Why not be people who live in the word? Why not be people whom the word lives out of? Why not enjoy this permanent, ultimate relationship, this dynamic relationship we have with God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit right here and now? Why not give your best time today? Why not give your best energy today to developing that relationship with God? Because I promise, if you will, eternal life is here right now, right here, right today. If you're not a Christian today, I want you to see exactly what you're doing with Jesus. You're denying Jesus. If you don't believe Jesus is who he says he is, according to the Bible, you're not only denying and losing out on Jesus, you're losing out with any relationship with God whatsoever. Will you turn from whatever false image you've built of Jesus, whatever false idol you've made Jesus into, will you turn from that and will you receive the true Jesus today? He'll forgive you. He'll free you. Eternal life for some of you begins right here, right now. I want to invite our offering attendants to come up. We're going to respond now by worshiping Jesus through the gifts of our tithes and offering. We're going to sing songs. Will you sing songs today? Will you sing songs today that reflect this amazing personal relationship you have with God? Will you not sing as one who's detached and one who's looking on, but one who is involved personally with a living God who loves you. Those of you who are Christians, you're invited to take communion today. As you take communion today, I want you to see that Jesus is exactly the person he says he is. He's fully God. He's fully human. And it's through him and him only that you might be forgiven of sin, freed, and that you may have eternal life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these truths. Thank you that although we're living in last times and there are times when things look desperate and difficult, this isn't unforeseen to Jesus. Jesus strongly urges us to stay calm and believe in him, that we are an anointed people filled with the Holy Spirit who safeguards the things that are true that we believed in, that we're an abiding people, that as we build our house on the truth of your word, we can grow in relationship with you Thank you, God, that you love us. Thank you that you pursue us. May we respond now. May we respond as we leave here and go out this week in a way that absolutely verifies the fact that we have eternal life. Eternal life doesn't begin someday down the road. It begins right here, right now. May we know you and Jesus Christ, your son. In his good name we pray, amen.